So yes, one of you, please be vigilant and let me know. So blood vessels, as we know, blood vessels have a very different role than the heart. Two components of cardiovascular system are heart and blood vessels. Ah. Heart and blood vessels. Okay. So blood vessels. First of all, there are two sets of blood vessels. We already know that. We got arteries. And we got veins. Okay. First of all, what is an artery? Arteries are named based on direction of the blood flow. This is where many students make a mistake thinking that arteries are named according to what type of blood they carry. No, arteries are named according to the name artery is given based on the direction of the blood flow. And that, that direction of blood flow is from the heart to an organ. Arteries carry transport blood away from the heart. Is there something I need to know in the chat? Okay. People are having that conversation. So heart to organ. Veins. Professor. Yes. Do you have anything like going on? Because all I can see is your documents that says like blood and blood vessel histology, circulatory anatomy. Someone else said the same thing. I can't even see like if you just have your screen on to, for yourself. I'm on the screen share. There we go. Now it's on. This is what I had or maybe not. Yeah, it just, it didn't, okay. but I can see now. Thank you. Okay, great, great, great. So two types of blood vessels, arteries and veins, okay. direction of the blood flow. Professor Lagia, I'm sorry. Um, Spruik Simonetti, I'm here. My son was trying to get into his class and having problems with his classes. Okay. Okay. I'll mark you. Thank you. So heart to an organ. This is why a vessel that enters an organ is always artery. Veins, the direction of the blood flow is from organs, actually I should say organs, organs to the heart. That's why vessels that exit an organ is a vein, because it's always away from the organ. So arteries carry blood away from the heart toward the organ, veins carry blood away from the organs toward the heart. Next is what type of blood they carry. Arteries typically carry, main transport, oxygenated blood. I think we went over some of this on the day one. With the exception, exception is pulmonary arteries. That includes pulmonary trunk too. So pulmonary arteries, don't carry oxygenated blood, yet you call them artery because the name artery is coming from the direction of the blood flow. Veins typically carry deoxygenated blood. Exception, again, pulmonary veins. Then, both arteries and veins have three layers of tissue in their wall. Just like heart has three layers, uh, you'll later on see that as we are talking about different vessel, different system, the number of layers of tissue that make up the wall of all the organs belonging to the system is standard. For example, Heart has three layers of tissue, epicardium, myocardium, endocardium. Middle layer is muscle, the other two are 
other types of tissue. If you look at arteries, you see three layers. If you look at veins, you see three layers. If you're looking at organs of digestive system, that number is four. Stomach, four layers. Esophagus, four layers. Small intestine, four layers. Large intestine, four layers. How thick each layer is out of the three is variable. And when you talk about branching, we're talking about cardiovascular system. When we are taking care of the branching, when arteries branch, now the number of layers start changing. So arteries have three layers of tissue and using these three layers of tissue will identify them. Three layers of tissue, outer to inner, outermost to innermost. Tunica, externa, tunica, media, tunica, Interna. Same with veins. Tunica externa. I'm just going to write ditto for veins. Tunica externa, tunica media, tunica interna. However, each layer, how thick each layer is and what is their consistency varies between artery and vein. First thing first, tunica externa is more like a Epithelial connective tissue mixed. Because, you know, external, think about it. You've got the blood vessel and you've got the organ. Basically, the external most layer is what's merging the blood vessel with the rest of the organ. And it also kind of separating it at the same time. So, tunica externa is a combination of epithelial and connective tissue. We don't have to know the names. But the consistency, the look of the tissue would be different. Epithelial plus connective tissue for both. Tunica media is the muscle tissue. What kind of muscle? Smooth muscle. Tunica interna is a, as we know, covering lining. It's a pure epithelial tissue. A single layer of squamous epithelium. Sometimes, just so that you know, when you are reading the textbook and you know, later on when we start working in the field, sometimes to distinguish the epithelial tissue on the surface and on the interior, the inner tissue of the blood vessel, the tunica interna, is sometimes referred to as endothelium as opposed to epithelia. So you might come across this term, endothelium. And if you think what endothelium is, it literally means endo meaning within the interior epithelium. So tunica externa, outermost, tunica media, middle layer, tunica interna, innermost. This muscle tissue, this is what is different between arteries and veins. So I'm going to insert another slide we need to, you know, um, learn this well so that we can use it for histological identification. So we are still talking about arteries and veins. Three layers, we are starting right there, the three layers. Arteries have well-defined three layers. especially a thick tunica media. The reason why blood flow through the arteries, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, the recoil, stretch and recoil action. The fact that arteries have much faster blood flow than the veins, arteries don't require assistance with blood flow is because they got this tunica media. Wherever there is muscle, muscle tissue is capable of stretching and contracting. So imagine a tight rubber band and a loose rubber band. A tight rubber band maintains its shape. You can stretch it, it will recoil after stretching. 
Stretching will be hard too. You know, a loose rubber band will expand easily. A tight rubber band won't expand that easily, but it would also recoil pretty easily if it got elastic tissue. So similarly, because of the tunica media and because of some, the elastic tissue as well, arteries can manipulate their own lumen and they don't require assistance with blood flow. There is an interesting interaction that goes on between the blood and the arteries, which allows the arteries to maintain their own blood flow. This is why you never, um, basically blood sample is step has to be taken. It's never from an artery. This is why you have to be extra careful during surgery. If you nick an artery, the patient might just lead to death unless in time you fix it. And I have heard about from you know previous students, I have heard heard about um, you know arteries being nicked and patients dying. There's no such thing as, oh gosh, I nicked a vein. Right? It's easily fixed. The blood flow is very slow. Think about opening a tap in full force and thinking a leak, think of a leaking faucet. That's what the blood flow will be between arteries and veins. Pretty much because of this tunica media. Veins have three layers. Sure. Veins have a pretty thick tunica externa, actually. A much thinner. Tunica media. Tunica interna is pretty much the same. <clears throat> so again, that tight rubber band, loose rubber band, when you look at the structures, I'll show you the structure in a second, you'll, you'll be able to see the difference, what I mean. Because of the thinner tunica media, veins require assistance. Veins require assistance with blood flow. That assistance comes in form of valves. There are venous valves. The longer the vein, the more valves. There's no such thing as an arterial valve because arteries got their tunica media. No valves, or you can say valves are absent. Faster blood flow. Veins have a much slower blood flow. <coughs> Anatomically, something else. Arteries have well-defined shape. Well, wherever there is muscle, there's going to be well-defined shape. Veins have poorly defined shape, which results in Large lumen. Veins would actually appear large vessel, large lumen, large vessel collapsed. That's how they will appear. Like again, like I said, a tight rubber band versus a loose rubber band. Right? All of us have looked, seen tight rubber band and loose rubber band. Basically, compare those two. You have a nice, thick, tight rubber band that maintains its shape. <clears throat> but it also looks smaller if that rubber band is loose. You've got other rubber bands that are loose from use. Veins are just by design like that. Loose rubber band that can't maintain its shape. So yeah, it looks wide, but at the same time, it's poorly defined shape. Arteries don't look as wide, but they are well-defined shape. And recap of what we studied on the day one. Arteries branch into, um, I'm just going to take care of the branch anyway. 
new slide. So the way the blood vessel, the circulatory system works is that arteries start as large arteries. We'll take care of this. In, in the blood vessel physiology too, but just some idea of the branching. Large arteries give rise to medium arteries, which then give rise to small arteries, sometimes Basically, small arteries can be present within an organ and then give rise to arterial. Other time, medium arteries will enter an organ and give rise to arterial. So either small artery or to medium artery. And, and I'll give you an example just in a second. After entering an organ, unless there are small arteries, a or an artery, a medium artery or a small artery gives rise to arterioles. Arterioles are exclusively within an organ. You won't see this kind of branching outside an organ. Each arteriole then gives rise to capillaries. Capillaries are also not random. They are present as capillary bed. So you can say capillaries or capillary bed. Understand the blood flow through the organ, then it won't be as confusing later. These capillaries start as arterial capillary, end as venous capillary. And you'll see what that means in a second once I draw it. So same capillary bed will start out as arterial capillary. As oxygen leaves, carbon dioxide enters, nutrient leaves, because they're basically these capillaries are all around the cells. Remember the day one, I was going over it, like water comes into your sink, you do dishes with it, outgoing water becomes dirty water. Similarly, the capillary bed adds, the capillary bed keeps delivering oxygen and keeps picking up carbon dioxide. The same capillary bed, toward the end of the bed, you call them venous capillaries. But there is no, there's no wall, no barrier, no end. It's just a continuous capillary bed. These venous capillaries then give rise to venules. Venules are also exclusively within organ. You won't see them outside an organ, just like arterioles. Venules will give rise to typically small veins or sometimes medium veins. For veins, rule of thumb is for every artery, we have two to three veins in the body. We've got far more veins than arteries. So, most organs, the outgoing vein is actually a small vein. Small veins merge to form medium veins. Medium veins merge to form large veins. And of course, these large veins end up being superior vena cava, large veins can form, merge to form large veins, larger veins. Superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, and pulmonary veins. Okay. Ultimately, these are the three sets of large veins. Pulmonary veins, some say, oh, they're not really large. They're more like medium veins, but you know, we don't need to split here on that. <clears throat> this is how the blood flow is. A capillary bed So arteries 
I'll take care of it right here. So arteries, as they branch, they go through what I call, I personally like to call onion peeling effect. Just like you keep peeling layers from an onion and the onion becomes smaller and smaller, arteries go through the same kind of effect as they branch. So large arteries have tunica externa, tunica media, tunica interna, all three layer in nice thick quantity. Medium arteries, what is that? No, hey. Medium arteries, oh, there's a accidentally pushed the things. Medium arteries, they have slightly thinner tunica externa compared to large arteries. Tunica media, still almost as much as the large artery. Tunica interna doesn't change. Then we're talking about arterioles. Small arteries, you know, similar to medium arteries, the small arteries are only present in certain organs. Arteriole, when it comes to arteriole, no tunica externa. Basically, tunica externa is absent, onion peeling effect. Tunica media. Tunica media is also in form of scattered muscle fibers, meaning much, much thinner than tunica media of medium arteries. Tunica interna is intact, same, same as here or here. Then comes capillaries. Onion peeling effect, no tunica media, no tunica externa, only tunica interna. So if we learn it now, next class, when we start talking about blood vessel physiology, things will make sense. So just a single layer for capillary. For arteriole, single layer of tunica interna and some scattered tunica media. Medium arteries will have nice and thick tunica media, tunica interna, one layer, and a little bit of tunica externa. Because these arteries are getting ready to branch and enter organ. Large arteries will have Nice and thick tunica externa, well defined. Tunica media, of course, very well defined muscle layer. And that tunica interna is same as any other vessel. So this is what I call onion peeling effect. But it literally means that each structure has its own function. And the structure always matches the function. Capillaries have a single layer meaning capillaries are meant for, what do you think they are meant for? Exchange. Exchange, exactly. Capillaries are meant for exchange. And exchange is not possible if we have thick layer, is it? So capillaries have a single layer of endothelium because their function is to allow things to enter and exit without much problem. And that would only happen if there is a single layer of tissue. Arterioles. Arterioles function is to control the blood flow within an organ. And in order to control the blood flow, what kind of muscle do you need? What kind of tissue do you need? Muscle. Not only that, the muscle fiber can't be too thick. If it's too thick, then you require a nervous system to control it for you. Later on, you will see, we'll talk about this. Organs have a little bit of their own zonal control, intrinsic control, based on local factors. And that local control 
basically it's channelized. I'm just saying that, you know, arteriole and their capillary bed, what's the relationship is like. For any organ, I'm not going to draw the organ, it's just going to make it too busy. Let's say after entering an organ, a, a small artery, or if it's medium artery, it doesn't matter, will give rise to few arterioles. So let's say that's the whole organ. Each arteriole will have entry into few capillary beds. There is another arteriole well, entry into capillary beds, few capillary beds from each arteriole. And this would basically take care of all of the part of the organ. Now, each capillary bed is going to be, here is the arteriole, here is the entry into the capillary bed, here is the second capillary bed. And now, this capillary bed is going to be, okay, capillaries, 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 and between these capillaries, there are going to be the cells of the body. That organ, cells, 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 cells. Toward the end of this capillary bed, and this end is going to be venial. Toward the end, these capillaries become venous capillary. No longer arterial. Because by the time the blood is present toward the lower capillaries, toward the end of the capillary bed, most of the oxygen is gone. Enough to give to these cells, but you can no longer say that this vessel has primarily oxygenated blood. So this is carrying deoxygenated blood. And so this is what I was saying, that you know, if we understand this now, it would be a very helpful letter. This is like, you know, basically like your water pipe. This is one faucet, that's the second faucet. And the arteriole, using its scattered muscle fiber, can control the blood, for, blood flow into, okay, these cells are more active, more blood goes here, less blood goes here. Five minutes later, these cells over here in this capillary bed are more active, so more blood goes here, less blood goes here. Just like you can tighten two faucet you have you know, access to two faucets, you can tighten one, open the other, so that more water goes into one sink and less water into another sink. This muscle fibers of the arteriole basically does the same. The muscle fibers can constrict, reduce the blood flow into this bed, and the muscle fiber here can relax and allow more of the blood flow, greater blood flow into this bed. This happens all the time. Not every capillary bed of every organ is active to the same extent every minute. It's more like this capillary bed, his, these cells are a little more active, next moment, next few minutes, these cells are more active, then again, these cells might be more active. So each organ is divided. We have that kind of microscopic control. Each organ is divided into this arteriole capillary bed, arteriole capillary bed. It covers all of the areas of the organ and overall also, Let's say this zone, this entire zone of the organ is more active, this entire zone is less active, then these arterioles will receive less blood, these arterioles will receive more blood. This is all about how much blood is supplied. Just like, you know, we do, okay? I'm not doing laundry right now, I'm not washing dishes right now, so I don't need that much water. Let's close that tap, I'm going to take a shower. So my shower tap is fully open, my sink, my kitchen sink tap is not as open. So did we understand this? I know this class is histology, but before you can just straight away look at the histology and name things, you need to know where, you know, where you are coming from. So with that, let's now look at artery and vein. Just a lower magnification. This is what I was talking about. I'm going to change the color so that I can mark. Both. 
Not a problem. Okay. Why is this not retracting? Huh? Why is the pencil thinking? I don't like that. I don't like thinking pencils. Let me do the thinking. So artery and vein, which one is what? Based on what we just studied. Out of number one, if this is number one, this is number two. Which one is what? Number one, the artery. Number two, the vein. Number one is the artery. Number two is the vein. Tight rubber band, loose rubber band. That's what I was talking about. And then the space is lumen. Even at this magnification, you can kind of see the, for the artery, for veins, you can't. For the artery, see, you can still see that tunica externa. See that thick line right there? As if someone has drawn with a pencil. Now right in the middle, tunica, media. And it's the edge. See that? Tunica interna. And then you are looking at you know, capillaries here, here. So let's enlarge that. Basically, it's the same that picture that we enlarged. Tunica, okay, lumen is easy. You can even see blood. See how well defined even the tunica interna is. See that? A single layer of squamous epithelial cell. That's basically what this is. Tunica interna. Purple. Tunica media. Very nicely defined. Nice and thick. This is what's smooth muscle tissue. Muscle tissue is muscle tissue. It has its own texture. We'll be looking at muscle again for digestive system. Um, I'm trying to remember if we look at, yeah, we look at muscle tissue in our urogenital system too. So basically it's the same. See? This is going to be the consistency of muscle tissue. Muscle tissue looks very similar no matter where it is. It has a smooth consistency. It won't be, you know, like kind of like a pinkish, reddish consistency. You won't see very many edges, borders, lines, nuclei, etc. And it's nice and thick here. Where is the tunica externa? This is what I was saying. The tunica externa is the layer that allows the vessel to, in a way, merge with the organ around it. So look at this here. Let me change the color. Green. Green is good. So look at this here. You can almost separate this part. See? What I'm tracing here. So this right there. This belongs to the vessel. This belongs to the organ. But this belongs to the vessel. See that? This is for the vessel. This is for the organ. Basically, this is tunica externa. It's not going to be nice and round because tunic externa is the connective tissue merges with the connective tissue of the organ. So arbitrarily, you can kind of trace that, okay, here, okay, all right. You can't point at this and call this tunic external because that's too far out. Can you say that, oh, this could be the tunica externa too right here? Possible. But is this tunic external? Mm, too far out. Is this tunic external? No. Too far out. So kind of trace around the vessel. 
I mean, the exam all have, you know, dots, like just like we did for the face-to-face uh, -face exam. I'll be using color. I'll be drawing the colored stickers and ask you to name. Question? This is simple. Then next we are going to go into blood histology. Then let's go back to the vein again. Tunica media, uh, look at the venous tunica media. So basically the tunica externa of the veins are more well defined. So here in this lower magnification, you can see the tunica externa of the artery better. So where is the tunica externa and tunica media and interna of the vein? Tunica interna, of course, yes, this is the line. And we'll look at the magnified version. Tunica externa, look at this, all throughout from here, all the way to here is tunica externa. Where is the tunica media? Do you see nicely defined muscle tissue? Just here. Actually, let me change the color. Just here. Just here. Right next to the tunica interna. Not much for a large vessel like this. And of course, that's the lumen. So this is what I was saying. Loose rubber band, tight rubber band. So you identify veins. And so, yeah, let me actually, while we're at it, let me show you this. Here's a capillary. See that? Just a single layer of tunica interna, a single layer of tissue, nothing else, basically, and the lumen. This is a capillary. Similarly here, look at that. Just a single layer of lumen, nothing else, capillary. Let's magnify that. The color changes slightly. But this is the lumen, just so that you know the perspective. We are looking at tunica interna, external media. You can kind of see the tunica interna. Nothing is well defined for the vein. You can see the nuclei, yeah, single layer. External, we can kind of see that either and see how thin the media is. Pretty much from here to here is the media, smooth muscle tissue. You don't see nuclei, you don't see, it. it's not a busy layer, it's a very thick, consistent layer. Well, I won't say thick, but it's a very consistent layer, uniform, consistent, uniform is the word I'm looking for. So this external, the tissue of the external, it goes all the way, extends all the way to here. And then here, then here, tunica media of the vein is barely identifiable and it's for a large vessel like this, it's not much. Actually this also, this part is also external. So from here to here, here to, here is the tunica media. Compare that to the tunica media of the artery. See how much thicker that is? This is why veins require assistance with blood flow. They require valves, one-way valves. Did we get this too? Questions? Okay, let's get going with blood histology then. I'm going to insert Another slide. So next is blood histology. <clears throat> so again, a little bit idea of what blood is made of. Blood, when you is centrifuge in a regular physiology lab, full centrifuge. And just so that, you know, it's, it won't, probably won't affect you, but if the campus is open for some labs in spring, 
most uh, most of our faculty are actually afraid to go in there. They, nobody wants to be first. I have actually volunteered to be the first. I mean, I'm immunocompromised, but I believe that if I'm to die, I'll die today from something else. If I'm to die from Corona, I'll get it from X, Y, Z. Doesn't matter. So um, I have actually volunteered that if there are labs on campus, I would like to teach some of the physiology labs for 144 and 145. Let's see if the request goes through or not. Um, if we are online in spring. So in a regular face-to-face -face labs, we actually get to extract our own blood and we get to centrifuges. And then we get to see the different components. But here I'm just going to go over the theory of it. So components of blood. When we centrifuge blood, meaning we take blood in a glass tube, we put it in a machine, the machine turns it at a very high speed, kind of like churning milk or churning butter, um, separating the components of milk. It turns it so fast that the components of blood basically separates out. The heaviest component settles at the bottom. Next heaviest one settles on top of that. And the lightest fluid part basically stays on the top. So blood is made of a fluidic portion a fluidic component, which we refer to as plasma. And then there are blood cells together. The cells are referred to as formed elements. So fluidic component, formed elements. Plasma is mostly water dissolved substances like salts, gases, etc., nutrient, etc., and plasma proteins. And typically, blood is over 55% plasma, less than 45% formed elements. So plasma proteins. We'll talk about plasma proteins for blood physiology. Let's just right now know that plasma is made of water. Plasma proteins, which stay suspended, meaning they are not dissolved. They interact and they start, stay suspended. Partly dissolved, partly not. And then we got fully dissolved salts, gases, nutrients like glucose, amino acids, ions, blah, blah, blah. Salts literally means ions, etc. Formed elements. Our focus is here. What are the different types of formed elements? Three types. Three types of blood cells. Erythrocytes. Alternately called RBCs. For the exam, I would expect erythrocyte, erythro meaning red, cyte meaning cell, red blood cell, largest in number, in quantity, <clears throat> forgetting the proportion, but it's a pretty high proportion, RBC. And then leukocytes. Leuco, white, site cell. Now, if you see this spelled with L E U K O in any textbook, that's sometimes some authors are using anglicized word, K for co, but the actual spelling that the rest of the world uses, you know, Latinized spelling is C, leukocyte, white blood cell. Third one is thrombocyte, thrombo clotting sites, cells, commonly known as platelets. Why do we call them platelets instead of XYZ cell? Because these are actually not full cells. These are cell 
fragments. They are given the name sites, but these are actually cell fragments. Out of which leukocytes has the most variety. Erythrocytes are all the same. Nonetheless, we'll look at those. Erythrocyte, how do we identify erythrocyte? Just a general idea of what they look like. These are what we call biconcave disc and non-nucleated. So non-nucleated, these are the only cells in the body that do not have a nuclei. <clears throat> the cell doesn't have nucleus. <coughs> non-nucleated, by concave discs appears red. Hmm. Appears red due to hemoglobin. They contain an iron protein substance known as hemoglobin. That's what makes the red blood cells look red. And there are so many red blood cells that it makes the blood look red. When in reality, it's just RBCs floating in the plasma. So non-nucleated biconcave disc. What does that mean? Think of a donut or a, or a bagel. Basically, these cells, they don't have a nucleus. So normal cell nucleus takes the darkest stain. Recall that's what we have seen in 144. The nucleus is always the darkest, darkest purple, blue. It's got the genetic material. Here, there is nothing in the middle, no nucleus to take up the stain. And rest of it also, there are such little substances, no organelles. Basically, the entire cell is packed with hemoglobin, which looks red. This is what the biconcave disc means, that when you're looking at it from the surface, looks like it's flattened in the middle, not flattened at the edges, not this, this. Biconcave disc, flattened in the middle. Of course, no nucleus. Uh, pretty easy to identify erythrocyte. Thrombocyte, thrombocytes are cell fragments. cell fragments, and they are scattered in groups, typically. So in places in the histology slide that we look at, you'll see thrombocytes present as scattered together, fragments like that. Pretty easy to identify. These two are identified in easily identifiable. Leukocytes have the most variety. They are not one size fits all, which is why we spend more time looking at leukocytes. Leukocyte. Okay, let's look over how many types of leukocytes there are. So leukocytes are differentiated into A granulocytes two types or subtypes, then granulocytes. A meaning no, gray meaning granule, site meaning cell. Granulo meaning yes, granule sites. So this name A granulocytes or granulocytes are derived from visible You know, fairly large conspicuous meaning well separated identified as fibre as separated granules think of coffee granules in cytoplasm so basically it's cytoplasmic granules that gives the name of 
a granulocyte and granulocyte. Okay. Keep in mind, there is no such thing as a leukocyte without granule. Leukocytes function is defense against all sorts of pathogen. And the cytoplasmic granules are packed with enzymes. So even granulocytes have granules. It's just that the granules are so fine, they don't take up stain the way the granulocytes do. Again, a bowl with coffee granule, a bowl with talcum powder. Now you try to pick up few talcum powder specks, eh, can't really do that. It's much fine. Coffee granules, yeah, these are large granules. Basically, that's how the granules are. Keep in, you know, in mind that all leukocytes have granules. It's just that we call them granulocytes that have large visible granule. A granulocyte doesn't mean that. Okay, sorry, I was hovering over granulocytes and talking about A granulocytes. Um, a meaning no. Well, doesn't really mean that they don't have granule. They just have much finer granules than don't take up stain the way the granulocytes do. And this stain is what names the types of granulocytes. So how many types of granulocytes there are and how many types of A granulocytes there are? Three types of granulocytes, two types of A granulocytes. All of these are, if you have the lab manual, all of these are there in the lab manual, but I'm just covering them anyway. So let's start with granulocytes. Three types of granulocytes. Neutrophil. Hey, wait a second. Why am I having a green lock? It's PHYL, right? Gosh. Uh, no, it's not. Thought so. I'm beginning to have green lock about this now. Just a sec. Neutrophil. Eosinophil. Basophil. Neutrophil, eosinophil, basophil. Okay, so neutral meaning neutral. Phil, philia, attraction. Okay, so this neutrophil, eosinophil, basophil. Eosin, eosin is an acidic stain. Baso, basic stain. If you understand the underlying, you know, naming system, you won't go wrong. So you want to look at three things when you are identifying leukocytes. Those three things are size, nuclear lobes, meaning how many lobes in the nuclei, and cytoplasmic granules. What is the color of the cytoplasmic granules? If there are granules or not, and if there is, there are, what's the color? Neutral. Okay, so staining the way the blood cells are stained. Most histology stains have some acidic and some basic component. Some cells like the acid, some cells like the base. Some cells don't like either. So the granules in neutrophil are neither acid-loving nor base-loving. Acidic stain is always in the spectrum of red. So, you know, red, orange, dark pink, acid stain. Granules that like acid stain, this is what the spectrum will be. Basic stain is in the blue spectrum. Blue violet, blue-black. If you remember that in 144, pretty much you could see the nuclei of most cells looked blue-black. 
a blue violet because the nuclei takes basic stain most of, for the most part. So keeping this in mind, you can actually identify neutrophil, eosinophil, basophil. So neutrophil has two to five lobed nucleus. Young neutrophil will have fewer, older neutrophil will have more. Very lightly varies, of course, relative stained granules. And they're fairly large cells. So neutrophil is going to look like two to five lobe nucleus. And the granules are there. The granules are going to be slightly light, very light pink, faded lilac, neither acidic nor basic, neither red nor blue. Neutrophils are also the most common type of cells. So we are going to see a lot more neutrophils than anything else. Eosinophil, acid loving, bilobed nucleus. Large, red or reddish orange, typically they are reddish orange, especially if it's freshly stained granules. Acid loving, eosinophils are going to look like very clearly bilobed nucleus and large reddish orange, bright orange. Granules. Basophils, much smaller. So neutrophil and eosinophil are comparable in size. Basophils are smaller cells. Bilobed nucleus, but the nucleus is invisible because it's obscure. Obscured by large blue black granules. So basophils are going to be smaller, and there is bilobe nucleus in basophil, but you are not going to see the bilobe nucleus because basophils have so many granules that the granules will completely obscure the nucleus. They can be actually so great in number that the entire cell might look like nothing but a dark patch or blue black stain or blue dark blue violet stain. This is what basophil might look like. And even if there's a little piece of cytoplasm that's visible, you will see granules in there too. Okay. Agranulocytes. Agranulocytes, there are two types, subtypes rather, monocytes. lymphocytes. Now this, because there are no granules, well, there are granules, but they don't take up, uh, you know, they're not as conspicuous. We go by the nucleus and the shape. You can ignore the granule part that we use for granulocytes. Monocytes are the largest cells. They are largest in appearance with what we call a horse shoe shaped nucleus single lobe so an ideal monocyte would look large with a horseshoe shaped nucleus and the nucleus of agranulocytes are not lobed you won't see separate lobes you'll just see one nucleus monocytes every monocytes today, tomorrow, or the day after, 
is destined to be a macrophage will transform into what we call macrophage. We'll talk extensively about macrophage in our uh, lymphatic physiology. Macrophages are very large, very powerful cells, and they are, the shape of their nucleus is very odd. No shape, actually. It's like a amoeba-like shape. So sometimes we'll find monocytes that look extremely large, and the nucleus looks like this. Does that mean it's a weird monocyte? Not really. If this monocyte has started its transition into being macrophage. Once it becomes a macrophage, macrophages look like this. So you never know. If you're work, going to work in a lab, you might see this and say, I never learned about that. What is that? Well, it's a monocyte that's transitioning into a macrophage. Not every monocyte is going to look like this. This is just an ideal monocyte. Lymphocytes, these are also smaller cells, just like basophil. There's no absolute in biology. If there is an infection going on, then even lymphocytes will be, appear slightly large, but never as large as eosinophil or neutrophil or monocyte, which is why you want to use more than one criteria, not just size not just granule, size, granule, nucleus. Lymphocytes would look like small cell. If there's an infection going on, maybe slightly larger, but never as large as neutrophil or eosinophil, maybe as large as basophil. And there is a clear single lobe nucleus, which most of the time is round. That's what it would look like. For many students, none of the other cells are problem, but there could be a little confusion between basophil and lymphocyte. Normally, basophils are slightly larger, but we got blood samples, as you will see, that are taken from animals that had, or humans that had, uh, this is mostly actually human blood, that had some kind of infection going on. So the lymphocytes actually enlarged. Keep in mind, even if a lymphocyte looks like it's as large as a basophil, lymphocytes would still have a greater cytoplasm to nucleus ratio, meaning there is always visible cytoplasm. For a lymphocyte, it's never going to look like this. Nucleus doesn't occupy the entire space. In basophil, it doesn't either, but the basophil cytoplasm is so filled with granules that it becomes a patch of color. So how do you, I mean, I don't think in the slide we have anything mysterious, but in real life, if you see two cells that look the same, same size, both have dark patch of color that could be nucleus or could be granules, and both are showing a little bit of cytoplasm along the edge. What is it? Is it lymphocyte? Is it basophil? What should I call it? What have I learned in school? Everything else being equal, look at that patch of cytoplasm that's visible. If that patch of cytoplasm shows you dark granules, it's basophil. If it does not, it's a lymphocyte. That's the rule of thumb we go by. Any question about this? So let's start our looking at the samples. Um, let me see if I should, if I do it PowerPoint, it doesn't really allow me to do a whole lot of writing, but see if I can move it up.
Can make the annotation mode. Come on. Don't need the annotation would let me. <laughs> Excuse me. Would let me write outside the picture. Oh yeah, it does. Okay. So here it is. Erythrocytes, as you can see. Hang on, where is the annotation tool? Okay, right there. I have to follow the annotation tool. Erythrocytes, no problem. Biconcave disc, see how the middle is no stain. Does that mean these are some weird erythrocytes? Not really. These are probably few erythrocytes clumped together. That's why you don't see that biconcave disc. What we see in here, this could be platelets, they could be just stain. They don't look like as dark as stain. So this could be platelets. My guess is these are platelets. Platelets. So is this right clear? Platelet. Neutrophil. So we are focusing on neutrophil. This is a neutrophil. This is a neutrophil too. So look at that. Look at the cytoplasm. It looks like some pinkish granules are there. Now it doesn't look like smooth. Looks like granular. But the granules are not too large and they are neither red nor blue. Few lobed nucleus. See that? This is one, that's two, that's three, that's four. Four lobed nucleus. And you can see the connecting band. Compare that to this neutrophil. It's one, two, three, four, five lobe nucleus. The older the neutrophil gets, the more lobes it will have. If it gets to live, many neutrophils won't get to live very long. They die fighting infection. But size, nucleus, granules, three things. You guys got that? Other question. Okay, so I'll assume no question. <clears throat> okay, now this slide, this is stain. You can clearly see that stain. Okay. <clears throat> so that's to show you, neutrophil can appear darker. How do I know this is neutrophil? Although, you know, it's, there's that human error. You know, in real life, you have to use your skills, your sense of discrimination. So if I'm looking at this cell, what would I call it? Oh, it's not, it's, is it reddish orange? Not really. Um, even if I say it's too dark, maybe it's eosinophil. Let's look at the lobes of the nucleus. You can clearly see one, two, three, four. And look at the slide. Look how there is just stain. This slide, the neutrophil seems darker because it was left in the stain for too long. An average blood slide is left in the stain for, you know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and then you have to incubate it so that the stain sets. Maybe somebody just left it in the incubator and, and went and had lunch. And basically it just stayed for too long in the stain. And it ended up taking darker stain than normal. In that case, everything would, else would look dark. Or there is some other kind of sign that stain, excess stain was there, which yeah, here in this case, you see that. This is why, again, I say go by more than one character. Go by three. Size, granularity, nucleus. This can be eosinophil, can be anything else. So although it's a little darker than light pink, still neutrophil. Another mature neutrophil. I just have many neutrophil because neutrophils are so common and they look different. You know, young neutrophil, older neutrophil. All right, here is the eosinophil. Bilobe nucleus, 
granules are a lot more conspicuous than neutrophil. Look at the granules of neutrophil and the color of the neutrophil, faded pink versus this. This is oranges. This is also our slide, which has been exposed to light for years. And so this picture was taken from a slide that was exposed to light. This slide, when it was new, the stain would look even darker orangish. I go by again size, approximately the same size as neutrophil, bilobe nucleus, darker reddish spectrum granules. What else could it be? Eosinophil. And I kind of feel sorry for you guys that if you look at these cells under microscope, they're so much clearer. than the image. <laughs> okay, let's look at this. So slightly lower magnification, lots of RBC. Eosinophil is still identifiable, bilobe nucleus, reddish spectrum, very conspicuous granules. So something like this, which is appearing like a dark patch of color and almost black, it can be anything else. Compare this to, compare this to this. This is what I was talking about, basophil and lymphocyte. No matter how dark the nucleus of the lymphocyte will be, which, you know, usually it's not this dark, but this slide also was left in stain. As you can see, the neutrophil is kind of dark too. So neutrophil, too many lobes because, you know, the way the blood was typically because before making the slide, the blood, um, you know, is mixed with substances and then it's... Uh, Basically, you discharge the blood from a pipette, dropper by dropper, from a distance. And you hold the slide with one hand. Let's say that the level of your femur and the blood is discharged from the shoulder level so that it spreads out. So sometimes cells get slightly twisted when they drop. This is what the result of that. So many things, you know, that you can actually take into account. Why is it looking like this? It's nothing like the neutrophil I saw before. Nothing like this, nothing like this, nothing like this. What is this now? Uh, it's just a cell got dropped from a, from a height and the nucleus got a little twisted. That's what it is. The cell got a little twisted. <clears throat> that happens. So neutrophil, and let's focus on this. Lymphocyte, why am I calling it lymphocyte and not a basophil? This is what I was saying. Look at the cytoplasm area. I don't see large conspicuous granules. Do you? So neutrophil, lymphocyte. Where's my page up, page down, close. I thought that's not the end of the slide. <clears throat> it's the same kind of slide, neutrophil and basophil from a different perspective. Oh, come on now. How am I calling this neutrophil? This is, you know, I'm showing you this so that you because you don't get to actually see the cells under microscope. Oh, horseshoe shaped, isn't it? Isn't that monocyte? No, look again. This is what I mean by don't go by one character. Go by three criteria. Size, nucleus, cytoplasmic granules. Could this be monocyte? Look again. Does it look like the cytoplasm has taken a pinkish stain? Yes. 
Does it look like it has granules? Yes. Can be monocyte, neutrophil. And basophil is very clear, basophil. See, almost you don't see any border, any edge, any cytoplasm, no nothing. This is another nice one. I'll compare this with lymphocyte. So see that. Remember I said if you're in confusion, you are looking at two cells of the same size. One is basophil, one is lymphocyte. And everything else being similar, look at the edge where the cytoplasm shows. Does it look like that? Come on. Does it look like the edge has granule? Look at this. Darker, little lighter right here, a little lighter. Does it look like, you know, cleaner cytoplasm? No. It looks like very granular. Let me see if I can erase that. No, it is like this. Actually, let me see if there's a laser pointer. I can use it. So right there, see? That edge. This is the darker part. Can you guys see that? This is darker. This is slightly lighter right around the edge. Okay, thank you. This is what I mean by basophil. Compare this to <laughs> page up is freezing. No. Compare this to uh, right there. See that? The lymphocyte. Yeah, the cytoplasm is visible. It doesn't have blue black granules. And the whole cell is not that blue black either. It's not showing a basic stain. So compare this with this. You see the clear difference. One is lymphocyte, the other is basophil. This is basophil. Very clearly basic stain. And you can even kind of see the granules. Okay, this annotation tool becomes almost invisible. Okay. Yeah, right there, okay, Ooh. see, even here you can kind of see granules, 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 granules. Monocyte, this is like I have taken it from a site, just to show you a perfect cell. Perfectly shaped monocyte and lymphocyte. In a perfect world, that's what they would look like. And they do look like that in, in, you know, in, in colleges that have a lot more money to buy very high quality slides. So for that, I have this for reference. This is it's a nice person of wool that I could find. This is what I mean by large lymphocyte. Sometimes lymphocytes can get large, but yet that cytoplasm will be visible. It almost looks like a basophil, but not quite. <clears throat> These two last two is for reference because it's just two perfectly looking slides. In fact, I don't know if this is this is a real picture or is this hand drawn. I know that this is, there are slides like this. I have looked at slides like this. This is from a collection that I found on the web. I just wanted a nice monocyte. 
because I realized that my pictures don't have a nice high quality monocyte. It's somewhere in a CD. I just have to dig it up. Okay, so do we understand the blood histology now? And are there questions? Let me just, um, yeah, just a second. Let me stop the share or actually maybe not. Oh, okay. So you guys are talking about yourselves. You guys can zoom in. How do you zoom in? I don't know how to zoom in. How do you zoom in in the slide? Oh, you have an iPad. So iPad does come handy, huh? Okay, so let me let me just stop the recording. I don't want this to be recorded. Um,